delegates on third day of international webinar impact of covid-19 and global trade under the under this head today's topic is nuance of robust research methodology for effective research i would like to welcome our honorable chief patent swami ji 20th pontiff he is the chairman of shri mr sivanjana baliya swamigal tamil arts and science college mailam serving the society is the foremost principle in his agenda for his spiritual and value based guidelines as or helpful to strengthening the students employability welcome swami ji i would like to welcome our respected secretary sir he is a young captain and the man of action the motive at this office optimistic and powerful performance is in all fields welcome sir i heartily welcome our principal sir he is an hard worker and well wisher of faculties as well as students he is always thinks about the development of the college thank you welcome sir i i feel jo- i feel joy welcome our chief guest dr a g vijayanarayanan sir he is associate professor professor of department of commerce wales institute of science and technology and advanced studies deemed to be university pallavaram chennai period to this he is a associate professor of cambridge institute of technology bangalore he won the best paper presenter award second international conference on business and management bangalore he secured the fourth place rank holder in madras university at the period of studying mcom he has completed two refresher courses in swayam arbit mooc courses from sriram college of commerce new delhi and university of hyderabad he has completed aicte training on learning academy fdb course on data science from indian institute of information technology nagpur he was a member of board of studies like gurunanak college chennai garden city university in bangalore and then doctoral committee member for an phd candidates at uh, srm university kotangkulathur life membership member like uh, indian econometric society indian commerce association indian accounting association management te- teacher consortium indian Ac- academic research association uh, all are it's located in the trichurappalli he is a visiting faculty of statistics for gfmp course at bsc institute limited chennai i humbly welcome you sir i would like to welcome all department hods faculty members students and all other participants once again i welcome welcome one and all thank you very much uh thank you ma'am i am pleased to welcome dr ag vijayanarayanan sir and my dear friend associate professor to our webinar gathering as mrs r amadavalli ma'am has already given brief introduction about him we will invite our chief guest now so please all of you join me welcome our chief guest to deliver his keynote address sir please you can start the session thank you so much mr uh, sabari raj hope i am audible and yes, uh, visible yes, yes. yes sir yes sir okay, okay. good morning so sir. first at the outset uh, let me thank the secretary and chairman yeah, swami ji of uh, shrimat sivanyana balaya swamigal tamil arts and science college for inviting me as a resource person for today's session i also extend my thanks to the principal of this uh, wonderful college dr s thirunavakarasu the head of the department of commerce dr anand rajan and my good friend mr sabri raj so without wasting uh, time uh, let me get into the topic because i have little more contents to explain a uh, few of them are known to you so that i can uh, skip those things uh, keeping one hour uh, in in mind as a constraint you know we need to uh, go about it okay first let me uh, share my screen hope it is uh, visible now yes 
yes thank you so much uh, i also thank all my uh, participants who are uh, active listeners and if you have any comments queries questions uh, any other suggestions you can please put it in chat box uh, both in uh, zoom as well as in youtube live i would try to uh, answer them at the end of the session okay so let's get started if you look at the title today i have given us nuances of robust research methodology for effective research we all know that uh, you know research is a very important dimension in today's life and to do a research we need to have a strong basics in research methodology and to have a very strong that is what we mean by robust robust means strong and to have a strong research methodology we need to know certain nuances okay certain skills are required in order to acquire the robust research methodology so what are those skills and what are those areas that we need to improve so that is what is my uh, title of the topic today for today before i get uh, into this first let me thank my gurus because without whom i am definitely not here today um, my immediate professor dr mv arlalan who is my research supervisor and guide uh, he was the former syndicate member and the head of the department of commerce in gurunana college without whom i am not here today and his guru that is arlalan sir's guru dr m ranganatham he was a former registrar and head of the department of commerce in university of madras a very humble uh, uh, guru and uh, his guru that is dr o r krishna swami who was an adjunct professor of management and he was uh, uh, there in national university in united states of america so this is what we call it as a guru parampara so dr uh, you know i would like to personally thank at this juncture dr mv arlalan dr m ranganathan and dr o r krishna swami sir without whom i am not here today and if you look at this audience uh, i would love to uh, you know uh, read I, i would i would recommend to read these two books that is one is methodology of research in social sciences which is written by dr o r krishna swami and dr m ranganathan we would have uh, studied this in various places and the next very important is doc, uh, research methods for business a skill building approach that's by dr uma segran that's a ville publications that is also a very uh, good textbook actually i consider these two as my bible for my research uh, and i proceed with that okay now everyone knows what is the meaning of research uh, before getting started if there is any uh, deviation or any other uh, problems technical problem please let me know so that i can uh, proceed further okay thank you right so we know what is uh, research and all the other uh, bookish definitions that we know it right it's a careful investigation or an inquiry which is specially made and uh, we search for a new facts in any branch of knowledge that is what the definition of research right what are the characteristics that a research should have number 1 it should be done in a very 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 systematic logical way okay doing it in a haphazard is not considered as a research it should be done in a very systematic way and there should be a critical investigation should be done and it's not just a compilation of facts okay that is just a compilation it cannot be called as a research and it should be done in a scientific way in a systematic way and it should be objective which means even if you do it or i do it the results should not change and there should be some logical content into the research so these are the basic characteristics which a research study should possess so these are the basic characteristics moving further what are the essentials of scientific method if your research is scientific then what are the those things which you need to have number 1 we go with data we don't go with just assumptions we don't go with just presumptions we rely on the data we collect some data and based on the data we prove either or disprove so that's what we call it as a empirical verification we collect the data in hand first hand and then we try to prove or disprove the theory the second one is the relevant concepts whenever we use a study we used to you know we need to use the relevant concepts with which we try to prove or disprove and the basic objective of any scientific research is objectivity which means it should not be subjective in nature it should be objective in nature anybody who can do that should get the same answer only then it is objective right the next one is ethical neutrality this is a very 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 valid vital point because whenever we do some uh, research we have some biased answer already we have fixed up some mind you know in our mind we have some fixed answer that is what we try to prove it but that is not actually what a research means that's what we call it as an ethical neutrality whenever before you start doing a research you should keep your mind blank and open 
you should not have some biased judgment or a value judgment and then you should not go with it and it should be testable or verifiable anybody uh, who wanted to uh, do this research should be a testable in nature and the next one is it should have a logical reasoning there should be some logical reasoning process so these are the basic essential characteristics or a qualities which a scientific method should possess right we all know that uh, you know research can be divided into two uh, one is called life science which is uh, uh, done in a very experimental way in a controllable situation in a testable situation right in a lab in a lab or something like that but the second one is the social science research which we normally get into okay because the social science research is not uh, done under uh, controlled environments or in some you know in in one or two rooms it is not like that so when it comes to social science uh, we we uh, include so much of subjects like commerce economics management psychology uh, anthropology history we have so many uh, departments which comes under the life, uh, life science or oh, sorry the social science so what happens what are the problems which arises in social science number 1 is the complexity of the subject matter because whenever we study about some topic it is it is all are interrelated therefore the subject matter itself becomes very much complex the second thing is that you don't deal with machines you don't deal with animals you deal with humans you deal with emotions you deal with attitude you you deal with their opinions so whenever you speak with a human uh, it is much more complicated because the people will have a different mindset at the different point of time and uh, the researcher may also may have some biased opinion about the topic that which he does and he may he may end up in uh, wrong decisions so these are the probabilities or these are the problems which may happen in social science research and there is no proper code of conduct like how we have it in uh, life science and in many times in many of the studies you cannot predict what may be the outcome the unpredictability that is the basic limitation of a social science and since we deal with so many uh, uh, you know subjects it becomes more of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary in nature and we also have problems in interpreting the relationship between the cause and effect this we i'll be uh, dealing it uh, in the later stage that is we call it as a linear regression right uh, causal relationship what is the cause what is the effect what is the cause what is the output and basically for our social science we always face this finance problem if it's a life science we have enormous uh, funds which are available but for social science we have very less finance capacities and so we could not uh, proceed further or uh, we could not advance further so these are the basic limitations which we have it in social science research, research. so i just i'm just uh, brushing up your thoughts on these uh, aspects because only then uh, uh, it will be uh, you, you can uh, follow me in the later stage so, so these are just the uh, brushing up of things right so what are the ways or what are the different types of research number one we know that uh, descriptive research what is a descriptive descriptive means describing what it is so it's basically you are not finding out something new you are stating whatever existing you are saying it that's it so that is what we call it as a descriptive research and when you say applied research there is a clear problem which is there and we want to find a solution especially if you take this companies corporates okay they will have some problem they know what is the problem they want the solution so when you apply uh, any uh, technique and find a solution we call it as an applied research okay the uh, researcher is not bothered about the way of research he is bothered about the solution the end uh, you know material which is needed so that's we uh, that's what we call it as an applied research the next one is the fundamental research which is a uh, Uh, also called as pure research let's say if you if you take newton's uh, relativity uh, sorry uh, newton's law and einstein's relativity theory and other things uh, they have uh, done their uh, research not just for any phd degree or any any anything in consideration they have not considered anything they wanted you know the curiosity in them made me made them to do the fundamental research okay that's what we call it as a uh, fundamental research without any consideration the next one is the quantitative research obviously we know it all the things are measured and then we try to prove it and uh, qualitative is that which cannot be measurable basically the uh, concepts of psychology uh, these things you know where it, it is a matter of opinions attitudes and other things they comes under the qualitative research so these are the basic types of research and if you wanted to segregate the different types of study there are two ways in which you can do it one is based on the intention of 
your study. The second is based on what kind of a study that you do. Based on the intent, you have pure research, applied research, exploratory research, descriptive, diagnostic, evaluation study, action research. And based on the study, we can classify them into experimental research, analytical study, historical research, survey, case study, and field studies. I have already spoken about the pure research that is a fundamental research. And I have also spoken about the applied research. Now let me get into the exploratory research. When you do it for the first time, when you do not know what your actual problem is, when you are trying to understand what your problem is, that's what we call it as a exploratory research. I'll give a very classic example. Now look at this COVID. No one knows, even the doctors do not know what this coronavirus uh, earlier. Now there is a situation which is happening and uh, it has almost uh, six months have gone. Okay, now uh, they are, they are you know, uh, undergoing what this virus and how it is affecting the people and how to come about it. So it is very new to the uh, world. So that's what they call it as an exploratory research when you do it for the first time. The analytical study or the statistical method, obviously you use some statistical models, mathematical models in order to solve the uh, problem. This is what we do it in econometrics. Okay. And the next one is descriptive, which I have already uh, spoken about. It's a fact finding study and historical research with the past data, whatever is available. We are trying to predict what may happen. Okay. If you look at uh, the balance sheet and the uh, profit and loss account statements of the companies, that's a classic example for historical research. So with that, we can know what is our financial status of the company. So that's what is a historical research which means survey we know that uh, survey is a fact finding again it's a kind of a descriptive study it's a fact finding study uh, we collected uh, uh, the uh, samples and then we try to end up with the solution so we have this social survey and economic survey which are the basic two fundamentals of the survey in case of case study you are not dealing about various respondents you are dealing only one person or one social group or one organization and then you are going in depth study that's what we call it as a what is an evaluation study very simple let's say uh, the government is introducing some scheme and after one year or two year the government wants to know whether that scheme is really useful to the people or not then it can go for evaluation study let's say we have there is something called mandrega which means 100 days guarantee employment program okay it has uh, introduced and then we want to know whether it is really improving the standard of living of the people then if you do something like that we call it as a evaluation study, which actually evaluates the program. Okay. Action research. Again, here it is a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, evaluation study, which is launched for solving a problem and how to move from this existing situation to the next level. So that's what we call it as an action research. We need to have solution. We need solutions. That's what we call it as an action research. An experimental study, it is obviously, you know, as I said, the causal relationship, cause and effect. If this is the cause, what will be the effect? I'll give you a simple example. We had demonetization. That was a cause. What was the effect of it? We need to understand. So in, in that lines, if you do it, then we call that as an experimental study. Right. There are different types of experimental. Uh, I'm not getting into it because each one will take uh, at least half an hour time. Okay. So I'm skipping a few things and then I'm, uh, I'm, I, I wanted to cover the most today. Okay. Right. So what is the process of doing research? Only now we have come to this, uh, uh, you know, the actual content of today's topic. How to go about the process of doing a research? This is applicable for both the uh, people who are doing their research and also for the people who have already done their research to enhance themselves. What are the various stages? Number one, identify the research problem. Okay. Number two, review of re related literature. Collect data based on that. And then prepare your research design, which is actually a blueprint. Okay. And then how to collect the samples, how to determine what is the sample size, what is the sampling unit, what is the sampling frame and all those technical uh, aspects. And once you are done with it, how much data should be collected? The next is how to collect the data, whether should we go for a questionnaire or should we go for an observation technique or what are the various methods in which we can collect the data? That is the next stage. And once you collect the data, it must be analyzed. This is where the statistical part is actually coming into picture. And once it is done, how to report it, how to write in a proper thesis format. Okay. So today's uh, research, I am speaking more of an academic research rather than the action research or the corporate research. Okay. I will be focusing more on the academic part of it. Okay. Right. Now I'll discuss one by one.
how to identify a research problem let me share my experience okay my practical experience then and there i'm going to share it so when i wanted to do my phd i i i uh, Jai, you know i Jai, yeah sir. yes uh, turn on your video it is already turned on mm. i have not turned off okay my uh, video is not coming yes yes sir i don't know because i have not turned off actually something problem only slides are coming sir okay i don't know even how to close this one minute one minute one minute no sir you continue okay yes, sir you continue sir yeah 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 so the first one is how to identify the research problem when we say research problem it is not actually the problem it is about what is the study area that you are going into it so when i contacted my professor he said okay in which area you wanted to uh, do as a study he wanted me to uh, to you know define whether you want to do it in marketing or hr or logistics or uh, whatever it is i said sir i want to do it in human resource then he asked me okay he gave me a homework then you do one thing in the human resource area you list out 100 different topics which can be done and then you come to me i said i'll do it in a week's time but literally speaking when i started doing it it took me more than 2 months or 3 months to collect at least 100 different topics because when you start thinking about it it looks very easy but when you start doing it it really becomes after you know collecting 20 or 30 or 40 topics various topics then it becomes more of a redundancy okay uh, it is repetitive in nature and so many things will happen okay so once i uh, collected it and then he asked me simply uh, to ignore 50 and then choose only the first 50 of my interest then i i i took 50 and from that 50 he wanted me to drop 25 and then i dropped 25 and i had remaining 25 topic and then he wanted me to condense it to 10 topics of my interest then i condensed it to 10 and from 10 to 5 and 5 to 3 and from 3 i chose only one topic of my interest so this is how i identified what my research problem is so that's why i have put it in a nutshell first select your broad area and then narrow it down and then convert your area of interest and focus on the problem that's the first way to do it okay once after selecting the problem what next we need to collect the review of related literature if you want to do it we need to identify what the research gap is okay what do you mean by a research gap a person who has already done something but he might have uh, left out few things the scope for the study and you need to identify what has been left left out by the previous researchers if you identify that then that becomes the research gap okay so how do you do the uh, related literature you can have published articles journals conference proceeding government reports Uh, various you know uh, internet uh, e resources today we have so much of e resources so these are the ways through which you can do the related literature survey right how to choose a problem this is uh, point number 1 okay how to choose my title of a topic very simple first look into your interest do not ask your uh, guide to choose the topic because sometimes the topic which he Uh, gives you may not be okay for you you may not be comfortable with it in that case then you may not be in a position to do it you may not be in a position to do it in an effective way you may be doing it but that may not be your cup of tea okay so first you need to find out what you are interest the second thing is it uh, do you have the right skills to do it the competency okay so that is very important and the third one is the resources for doing some researches you need some resources or infrastructure facilities which are required to do okay so these things you need to uh, consider when you when you choose what your title is number 2 researchability there should be something which should be researchable in nature if there is nothing in that then there is no point in uh, uh, doing that topic the third one is the importance and the urgency why should i do this what made me to choose this topic what is the need of the hour that should be considered when choosing a problem the next one is originality it should not be copied from someone it should be original in nature and the next important thing is it should be feasible because there are some topics which may really look like a, a very nice topic to do but once you get into it you will feel that you are not in a position to complete it i'll tell you a very simple example now i as a human resource person i wanted to do 
uh, at a PhD topic on performance appraisal. We know that uh, we have different types of performance appraisal methods, 360 degree performance appraisal, that, this. We have n number of uh, appraisal methods. But is it really practical to go into a company and collect the data from your employees? Never. They will never uh, uh, give the data. They will hesitate to give. Even the company human resource manager also will not allow us to do. The topic may look good, but the feasibility is not there. Okay. And very importantly, whenever the topic that you are taking for some study, it should have some social importance or social relevance should be there. That is very, very, very important because only then at the later stage, it can be uh, uh, published. It can be given to the policy level decision making bodies to take up uh, some uh, corrective action. We can take up some real practical problem which exists in the society and we can do a research problem. So these are the criteria or the parameters which you need to consider before choosing a problem. Right. One. Next, how to formulate a selected problem. Now I have identified what my research area. Now, how to formulate it? Number one, first, create a title, develop a title of your interest and then try to bring a conceptual model, give a conceptual model and then identify what are your objectives of the study. And based on their objectives, you give answer means you, you uh, set some investigative questions which needs to be means which needs to be answered. That becomes your hypothesis. Okay, that is the formulation of hypothesis. And for some things, you have operational concepts, operational definitions of some concepts. I'll come to this when I uh, discuss about my own study. Okay, and please limit your scope of the study. So these are the uh, stages which you need to do after formulating uh, your uh, selected problem. First, create the title, build a conceptual model, set the objectives, and from that objective, set the investigative questions, which in turn frame as an hypothesis. And then you need to have operational definition and limit your study. So these are the basic formulations. Now, let me give a very classic example of my own PhD. If you study, if you see my topic, a study on individual human capital formation among the millennials in Chennai ITF. So this is my point. When I speak about this, most of the people, they will say that, sir, this doesn't belong to human resource. This belongs to economics. No, it is not so. If you use the word human capital formation, it, it is related to economics. But I'm not uh, doing this in a macro level. I'm doing it in a micro level. So I wanted to bring down to individual human capital formation. For one person, how is it happening? I'm not studying for the society. Therefore, this is the operational definition which I have given. And who are all my participants? I have considered only the millennials. Who are millennials? Who are born between 1980 to 2000. So I'm, I'm restricting who is my target audience. And uh, where does I restrict? In Chennai ITF. When I say Chennai ITF, I mean uh, Kanjibaram, Ch Chengalpat, Thiruvallur and Chennai, these four areas. Okay, So this is the geographical uh, uh, scope which I am giving it. I am not uh, extending beyond it. Okay, So this is my title. This is how I framed it. Right. Once you are done with the uh, problem and once you are done with the review of literature, what is the next important step? The next important step is the research design. It is like a blueprint. Okay. What is the, uh, you know, in, in your journey, what is the first step? What is the second step? What is the third step? And how do you uh, finish your journey? It's a very simple thing. Okay. So that is the research design which we need to build. And in this uh, creating or preparing a research design, we need to consider four important aspects. Number one, means of obtaining the information. How do you collect the data? That is very, very, very important. Number two, what are the availability and the skills of the researcher? This is very important because if the researcher is not competent enough, then he cannot proceed further and he may resort to uh, outsourcing and things may happen like that. And what is the time availability that you have? If you have only uh, uh, three years or of a limited research, then uh, that is again a constraint. And we also have the finance factor or the cost factor, which is related. So we should keep all these things in mind when we prepare a research design. What are they? how to collect the data, what are the availability and the skills of the researcher, the time factor, the cost factor. These are the things which you need to keep it in mind when preparing a research design. Right. A very important question. From now on, it will be a little more interesting because I'm getting into the topic. Okay. We all know this hypothesis, hypothesis, hypothesis. We have always been listening into hypothesis testing, testing of hypothesis, all these things. Okay. What do you mean by an hypothesis? 
it is just an assumption which we have made which we wanted to actually test whether that assumption is right or wrong whether it is accepted or it is rejected right the next question arises is hypothesis is necessary for all the study definitely no because my guides guide have given a very very uh, clear example you can uh, you can see this here well it is for analytical and experimental studies it is needed hypothesis is needed but for fact finding studies because when you say fact finding studies it is a descriptive research you are just describing what it is therefore you are not going to find something new and exploratory study is you are doing it for the first time when you do it for the first time you do not know which way you are going in therefore in these two aspects hypothesis is not necessary it is not mandatory but for all the other ana uh, other analytical uh, models hypothesis is mandatory it is needed okay so this is very important thing and uh, we have different types of hypothesis we know this uh, null hypothesis very much but apart from null hypothesis we have descriptive hypothesis relational hypothesis we have causal that is cause and effect this uh, this cause will lead to this effect that's called causal hypothesis we have something called working hypothesis let's say uh, if you are doing uh, some projects uh, from the funding agencies like uh, ugc icssr and something like that okay you will uh, extend your research to 4 years 5 years 6 years something like that so every year we need to uh, report what we are doing in that case we prepare working papers for working papers we create something called working hypothesis and null hypothesis we all know this this is the most commonly used in social science null hypothesis statistical hypothesis common sense hypothesis and analytical hypothesis there are plenty different types of hypothesis which we have it right how do i create some statement how do i create an hypothesis statement what makes me to uh, let's say uh, there is no significant uh, uh, difference between this and that there is no significant association right you say some uh, two things right there is no association there is no difference how do you make it very simple the source of the hypothesis is derived either from theory or observation or analogy or intuition personal experience uh, finding state of knowledge and all these things because of this you actually create some hypothesis okay now i'll give a very very simple example you want to purchase a laptop now okay when you want to purchase a laptop now what will you uh, think the first the price right whether uh, is it really worthy enough so the price is actually deciding whether we should buy a laptop or not so what is cost price what is the effect whether to buy or not so price is actually influencing your purchasing decision which means price is an independent variable which has an impact on the dependent variable what is your dependent variable whether to buy or not okay now how do you get this because in economics we have studied something called law of demand other things remaining constant when the price increases quantity demand decreases correct so based on that theory we have formulated this hypothesis okay so this is the way in which you you build up or you formulate a hypothesis okay right uh, am i audible am i uh, audible yes sir so, Jai, yes sir okay audible, audible. everything is clear sir clear thank you so much thank you yes, right so the next very important aspect this is the uh, you know uh, very important dimension where people will have more doubts how to determine the sample size the sampling design the sampling methods or techniques whatever we call it as okay okay now what are the different types of method we have we have different types of sampling method Uh, which we classify normally into two things one is the random sampling or which we call it as a probability sampling or we have non random sampling or we call it as a non probability sampling in case of random sampling we have simple random sampling stratified random sampling systematic random sampling cluster sampling okay we have so many different types in case of non random sampling we have convenient sampling judgment sampling snowball sampling purposive sampling uh, quota sampling we have different methods of uh, sampling methods right which method is the appropriate method sir which one is right sir which one is wrong sir this is the most important question which normally many of the researcher will ask me i'll say a very simple answer there is nothing which is right there is nothing which is wrong okay okay then what decides actually what is your study what is your objective that will actually decide what kind of a technique or what kind of a sampling technique okay so what actually decides 
you can see at the down what are the factors which determines the sampling method the purpose of the survey the size of your population that you are going to study and the nature of the population that you are going to study and the extensive of accuracy which you actually want it okay that uh, the accuracy level what you actually desire the time constraint and the finance constraint all these factors actually decides what kind of a sampling technique should be done normally we say in uh, social science uh, we have something called level of significance hope we all know it what is the level of significance which means up to what level we can make mistakes uh, that's why we normally uh, use one percentage or five percentage uh, we normally use five percentage as a traditional uh, method and uh, uh, in social science we can uh, commit error up to 10 percentage so up to 90 percentage we can be accurate only 10 percentage there may be a uh, you know a false answer which may come but just imagine if this is applicable for life science what may happen let's say you are going for an operation theater now i am going for an operation theater to get surgery okay i want to get operated now if doctor comes and say see i have done this operation so many times but uh, uh, there is a chance that uh, five percentage which may fail will you go and get operated never in social science the error can be accepted but in life science the accuracy is 100 percentage needed you cannot go a mistake there in life science but in social science since we are dealing with the people we are dealing with the people's emotion opinion attitude and all these things uh, we we give error up to 10 percentage right now these are the different uh, this is the very important slide of uh, today what is a sampling frame there is actually called as a source list a source list from which we uh, we choose the uh, samples if you look at my uh, topic chennai it hub so those who are actually working in chennai kanjipuram thiruvallur chengalpad they are actually the, the sampling frame and i want to choose each and every person they are called a sampling unit so sampling frame is like a basket and sampling unit is like the apples which are kept in the basket to say it in a very simple way okay uh, the next one is sample size sir how to choose the sample size sir my guide is saying 200 is enough sir my guide is saying 400 is needed sir my guide is saying 1000 is needed sir something like that right so how to choose a sample size before getting see now today uh, very scientific uh, systematic way of sample size estimators have come even if you google uh, sample size estimator if you know what is your population size and if you want to know what is your accuracy level then uh, what is the exact sample size which you need to collect uh, it is calculated by the uh, formula which is available in the system okay but there are some misconceptions and misstatements regarding this sample size which i wanted to break this is actually a myth which i wanted to break what is it number one there is something called one tenth rule which means whatever their population size collect 10 percentage as a sample now let's say in my study i studied about the human capital formation among the millennials those who are studying in college in chennai there are let's say assume uh, 10 lakh students uh, are uh, uh, pursuing their higher education in colleges so if i want to collect 10 percentage it means 1 lakh students i have to contact and then i have to collect data from them is it really possible definitely no so this one tenth rule is not applicable for large populations the next one is larger the sample size greater may be the accuracy this is again a very very uh, half baked truth this is not false but this is just a half baked truth i'll tell you why now when i say chennai it hub see i am living in south chennai okay since i know many people from south chennai if i collect even 5000 or 10000 data from only south chennai can it represent the entire chennai no because i am uh, ignoring the north chennai i am ignoring the central chennai i am considering only the south chennai so can that be called as a representativeness no what is very important is rather than the sam uh, the the bigger sample size what is represented is the representativeness is essential even if i collect 200 from south 200 from north chennai 200 from central chennai that is more than enough because representativeness is there but if i collect 10000 only from south chennai i cannot uh, generalize the findings to the entire Chennai. No, it is not possible. So that is second myth. The third myth, this is a very, very uh, important myth. They say that random sampling is always better than non-random sampling. They say that random sampling is very, very scientific than non-random sampling. If that is the case, then why should we have non-random sampling? We can uh, simply ignore it and we can uh, take it off from the research methodology syllabus itself, right? 
why should we go for a non random sampling if it is not scientific why should we have that it is not like that again that is what i am telling you that is basically uh, based on what your objective is now let's say uh, a psychology student wants to do a study about uh, the life of a hiv affected person okay that is the topic that he is going to do do you have the sample size do you have the population do you know uh, how many people are affected by hiv can you go and collect the data no it is literally not possible so what we have to do we have to first go and meet one person who is affected by hiv we have to collect the data from them and then we should ask them because they may know other people who are affected by hiv they will uh, uh, give the reference to the second person to the reference to the third person and that's how we collect the data so here non random sampling alone can work random sampling cannot work here that is why i'm saying uh, random sampling is definitely not better than uh, non random sampling it actually decide what is your objective that only will decide it okay so whatever the example which i gave is a classic example of snowball sampling okay right let's come uh, to a very important topic that is the scale we have four different scale we all know it whatever your uh, scaling type it is basically uh, coming under four uh, different types of scales one is nominal scale ordinal scale interval scale and ratio scale and this nominal and ordinal scale they are called as categorical scales and interval and ratio scales they are called as a measurement scales so these measurement scales can be used for advanced analysis like parametric test okay but if your data is in nominal and ordinal scale which is called categorical scale you cannot go for a parametric you should you can go only for non parametric test i'll tell you what is this before getting into this let me come here if if you look at this nominal scale it is just a number is nominated to denote something there is no distance there is no order there is no origin i have given an example female is 1 male is 0 so 1 represents female 0 represents male so since i have given female is equal to 1 it doesn't mean that female are bigger than male no it is not that the number doesn't have any value in nominal scale okay so it just represents what it is okay the next one is the ordinal scale here there is an order but there is no distance and origin let's say uh, a, a, an example what kind of uh, income class that you belong to uh, lower income class middle income class higher income class there is a clear cut difference okay in order there is an order because you start from lower to higher or higher to lower there is an order but there is no distance there is no origin which means that the difference between the low income and the middle income is not the same as the distance between the middle income and the high income you cannot guarantee that right so there is an order but there is no distance and there is no origin the next important is interval scale which we call it as a likert scale okay we we call uh, this uh, rensis likert five point likert scale strongly agree agree undecided or neutral disagree and strongly disagree here you have order you have distance but there is no origin you can see here the difference or the distance between strongly agree and agree is 5 minus 4 is 1 it is the same distance as strongly disagree and disagree 2 minus 1 is equal to 1 so the distance is same there is an order but there is no origin what is an origin when you say origin you need to start from zero so whenever you have something from zero that's called ratio scale if you ask my uh, uh, age i would say i am 40 years old okay what is 40 years zero to 40 if there is someone uh, who is uh, 20 years old i can very well say that i am twice the age of that person because he is also from zero to 20 i am also from zero to 40 therefore i can make Uh, i can conclude that i am twice the age as that person so there is a distance there is an order there is an origin so this interval scale and ratio scale are the most uh, wanted scales because you can go for parametric test okay now you can see this in nominal there is no order there is no distance there is no origin whereas in ordinal there is an order but there is no distance there is no origin in interval there is an order and distance but there is no origin in ratio all these three parametrics are available okay right so these are the different scales that we have i am not getting into these aspects uh, we have arbitrary scaling judgment scaling social distance scaling item analysis rating scale ranking scale and sd scale which we call it as semantic differential scale we have so many different types of scale but whatever the scales that you have it comes uh, in either of the four four scales only there is nominal ordinal interval or ratio right 
now how to collect now uh, we have uh, done with the sampling design and uh, this thing now how to collect the data we have interview method we have direct personal interview indirect personal interview and we have uh, secondary data that is the published uh, sources from the official publications of government we have reports of various committees so there are various ways in which you can collect the data i am going to speak today on uh, the questionnaire aspect what are the basic do's and don'ts which you need to keep it in mind when you prepare a questionnaire number 1 specify the purpose for which the information is required introduce yourself what are you uh, why are you doing this topic okay uh, specify the purpose for which you are doing it because that will really uh, make the readers to get into it number 2 you may be a expert in your uh, in your domain in your area which you do but don't use complicated words or technical words because the respondents may not know it so keep it uh, very simple the language should be very simple and jargon should be avoided number 3 please be more specific and clear to what actually you wanted it do not have this ambiguous questions which which leads to actually the confusing uh, uh, things okay the next one is avoid personal and sensitive questions there are Uh, some studies which we actually don't need some questions at all but uh, unnecessarily we ask some personal and sensitive questions what religion you belong to uh, uh, you know if you are uh, married or whether you are separated or you are divorced you don't need all these nonsense questions okay so avoid those personal and sensitive questions unless and until it is necessary and uh, uh, there are some questions which are based on your sentiment faith and belief that should also be avoided let's say Uh, which religion do you practice okay if it is not necessary for your study do not ask such kind of a questions and the questions must be asked in a logical way uh, i came across with one example i would uh, which i would like to share uh, you know they have asked first what is your age second what is your gender third how many uh, how many children do you have uh, and then fourth they have asked whether you are married or not first they are asking how many children do you have and then they are asking whether you are married or not this may not be applicable for our culture for our indian culture but if you ask the same questionnaire in uh, us united states it may be applicable because their culture is different so the sequence is very important uh, the audience uh, culture that is also important and repeated questions please avoid it okay and uh, sufficient spacing that is very important and it should not be so lengthy so that the people get bored and they don't fill uh, completely okay because i have uh, i have had a very bitter experience when i did my phd and do not again ask any irrelevant or unimportant questions and uh, avoid the open ended questions because normally most of the times they they go with open ended questions it is not required because uh, you cannot analyze those data okay and uh, uh, the questions and alternative answer choices should be properly coded again that is very important margin spacing uh, these things should be kept uh, should be taken care of and uh, the flow the logical flow should be very smooth from one section to the other section and uh, before you go in live please make sure that your questionnaire is pre tested and revised with uh, pre testing and other uh, uh, techniques right how to do it we have three different tests one is test of validity test of reliability and test of practicality i am not getting uh, into the deeper aspects of it because it may take more time uh, I, i have to cover uh, a few more slides also uh you know uh, whenever we prepare this questionnaire we we go for uh, this cronbach alpha test of reliability right to check the uh, uh, what is it the reliability value of the variables that's where we use this test of reliability okay validity means whether the questions are valid whether the proper question is asked and in proper format it is asked or not that is what we mean by a validity and is it practical in nature so that's what we call it as a test of practicality and there is a huge difference between pre test and pilot study again this is one of the major area where most of the people they get confused pre test and pilot study what is a pre test pre test is a is just a part of a pilot study pre test is an like an inner circle and pilot study is like an outer circle okay just imagine like that pre test is a trial test which actually uh, you use it in uh, preparing the questionnaire stage okay Uh, so before finalizing it and uh, uh, and meeting the respondents you first collect some uh, 50 respondents and then you try to correct your questionnaire and then you go for a pilot study where you actually collect the entire thing and then you start uh, running the basic analysis and seeing whether it is uh, coming it is like a main uh, uh, replica it is just a, a small replica of your entire study it is like a protocol 
before we do this plane uh, we have some uh, protocol type right prototype uh, plane we used to have it right so it is like that pilot study is the small scale replica of the main study so pre test and pilot study both are important and should be done right once all this data is collected what is the next stage first we have to edit we have to see whether in any incomplete inconsistency data is there if it is there we have to remove it and once that editing is done we have to classify or uh, arrange it in rows and columns and once it is done we have to convert that into numbers and that process we call it as a coding and after that coding is done we have to go for a tabulation that is we have to present it in table uh, format okay and uh, then the data would be analyzed with all this uh, sophisticated uh, statistical software uh, the normal uh, uh, software which we use it in our academic research is spss apart from the spss we have sas uh, in case if you want to go a little further we have eviews we have r we have uh, brittle uh, uh, you know if you want to use uh, time series and other things we have brittle okay we have so many uh, statistical software we have it right the next one is the analysis this is the most important point all the statistical analysis can be classified under five headings one measure of central tendency which actually speaks about the averages that is mean median mode harmonic mean geometric mean percentiles and all those things and then we study about the measures of dispersion where we study about the standard deviation skewness kurtosis range uh, coefficient of variation mean deviation and all those aspects and in terms of association we have this chi square correlation and regression analysis actually uh, in order to take this we need separately one day uh, at least two hours uh, then probably i can touch up on the statistical aspect uh, if we get some uh, one more time uh, we'll we'll see to it and then we have something called measures of differences where we have t test and in t test we have three different types of t test one sample t test independent sample t test we have part sample t test and so on and we have f test which is we call it as a anova that is analysis of variance and apart from that we have time series okay and apart from this we have advanced techniques like multiple regression factor analysis cluster analysis discriminant analysis conjoint analysis all these are uh, and uh, at last now the most important one is the structural equation modeling that is we call it as a sem okay these are all the higher level of analysis okay so all this higher analysis if you want to perform it your data should be either in interval scale or ratio scale because only then parametric test can be performed for non parametric test most of the advanced techniques cannot be performed okay what is a parametric test very simple if you want to run those test you need to fulfill certain assumptions or parameters only after fulfilling that then you can proceed with that what is the basic uh, assumption that we have our data should be normally distributed when i say normally distributed it's a bell shaped curve which you all know about it right it's a bell shaped curve uh, half of it uh, uh, 0.5 to the left 0.5 to the right so that is what we call it as a distribute normally distributed data only when your data is normally distributed you can go for an advanced statistical techniques if not you can go only for a non parametric test but for every parametric test there is a equal non parametric test which are available which i wanted to show it you can see here see in association for parametric we use carl pearson's correlation coefficient similarly we have in non parametric spearman's rank correlation we call it as ro and in case of test of difference independent sample t test is there for parametric similarly equivalently man witney test that is we call it as a u test which is available in non parametric for pat sample t test we have wilcoxon sign for one way anova we have kruskal valleys for multiple regression we have binomial or logistic regression okay for uh, causal relationship so for every parametric there is an equal non parametric test which are available and normally uh, all the test can be easy cl classified into univariate which means study about one variable bivariate study about two variables multivariate study about multiple variables which means more than two variables you can look at this parametric and uh, non parametric test i have given the due credit to the person who has created it uh, he is dr michael hernandez so i have given the due credit to him and uh, uh, this is the last part of my study uh, i request the audience to go on mute thank you uh, this is a very last part of it you have done all the analysis how to write a thesis report what are all the areas that are required number 1 you need to have introduction review of literature should be there analysis and interpretation should be done findings of the study should be discussed and then we should go with suggestion and conclusion these are the basic outlines 
of any report which you need to have and in that what are all the areas that we need to consider when writing a phd thesis style uh, active style or a passive style we need to go with the active style of writing and we need to uh, consider the grammar and unclear writing should be avoided we should uh, use the proper gender numerals should be properly used whether to go with uh, roman letter numerals or arabic numerals or something like that and quotations whether is it a single quotation or a double quotation we have to use it properly we have to go with abbreviations uh, when to use abbreviate uh, you know there are few things which you can abbreviate only those things should be abbreviated footnotes which we know it and bibliography and references these are the very important aspects or dimensions which you need to consider before writing a report right now i have classified the entire report into three aspects number one pre factory items which are called the uh, first items okay they are the title page researcher's declaration and uh, the certificate from the guide uh, the acknowledgement which you write it and the table of contents list of tables graphs charts diagrams and abstract or synopsis all these are the pre factory items which are the first important thing the next important thing is the body of the report which i have classified into four first one is introduction where you need to cover up theoretical background review of literature scope of the study objectives of the study the hypothesis uh, which are to be tested if you have any operational concepts you need to say all these things should come under introduction second is the design of the study where you are going to speak about the methodological part what is the data source what is the sampling design what are the data collection instruments which you have actually uh, did it and what are the field work that you have done it uh, how is the data processed and uh, the limitations of the study this comes in second part the third one is your findings and discussion that is your analytical tables and other interpretations and all those things and then the last one is the summary conclusion and the recommendation so this is the basic second part and the last part is we call it as a tail items or terminal items where bibliography should be there appendix should be there uh, and uh, the the data collection instrument that is the questionnaire that should be attached there and if you have very complex table a very long running into a number of pages those table should be also uh, uh, taken to the terminal items and if you have any glossary that should be taken to the terminal items right i'll end up with this many of you will have this sample size problem so this is a very classic uh, uh, sample size estimator which is given in uh, uh, dr uma segren's textbook in page number 133 i have given it you can look at it if your population size is 10 your sample size should be 10 if your population is 100 your sample size is 80 if it is 200 it is 132 and if it is 10000 it's 370 if your population size is 75000 it's 382 okay if it is 50000 it's 381 if your population is 10 lakh look at the sample size it is 384 so this 384 will represent the entire 10 lakh sir how did they calculate this sir there are some sample size estimator which the formula which i have given it z square into p into q divided by e square 1 minus p is actually q okay so z is confidence level uh, the error uh, level which we need to have in p is the variance of the population and e is the allowable error or the margin of error which we call it as so we have this table which we can actually use it for our study if you are uh, a population if you know what your population size then you can uh, calculate what your sample size is okay so i may be uh, i would have been little fast but uh, i think uh, i have uh, completed on time so i'll just stop uh, presenting okay so now i am open for the questions are you there i uh, wait vijay yeah yeah thank you sir for your wonderful session the participant mm. who attended really enjoyed your presentation about research methodology we appreciate you making in your busy schedule to speak our participant thank you once again this is question and answer session participants it is the time to clarify your doubts if you have any doubt you can clarify with our speaker please post your question in chat box or raise your hand please anybody you have any question please post in chat box kausalya no one anu
अनुराधा मैम अनुराधा मैम नो सर नो सर एनी एनी नथिंग सर ओके ऑल आर क्लियर सर ओके मैम इफ एनीबॉडी इंटरेस्टेड टू आस्क क्वेश्चन प्लीज राइज योर हैंड चार्ट बॉक्स विजय सर इज चार्ट बॉक्स एवरीथिंग क्लियर हेलो यस हेलो यस सर यस सर I'm a professor Tamil Arasen. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Oh, okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Ah, uh, it's a very good uh, presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Ah, uh, I would like to <clears throat> uh, need some clarification from the uh, expert. You yes, said sir. that um, that uh, pilot study is a, a wider study, whereas the pre-testing pre -testing is part of the pilot study. Yes. Yes, but when we go through some books as well as websites, yes, they are confusing that as if they are one and the same thing. No, sir, no, no. Uh, uh, could you throw some light on that? Okay. Then there is a convention if the population size is known, that we can go for um, a probability sampling. Yes. And if it is uh, unknown, they, then we can go for uh, non-probability sampling. Yes. Uh, here also you can throw some light. Sure, sure. Then, uh, still people are, of course, and particularly young researchers, uh, researchers are confused with. So, what type of statistical test they can go for? Okay. Um, of course, uh, specific to their uh, questionnaire. So, could you throw some light on all these things, sir? Otherwise, your presentation is very good. Okay. Uh, you have covered all the basic concepts within this uh, short span of one hour. Yes. And of course, you have made it very clear, and particularly for the young researchers and students, it will, of course, give a, a lot of benefit. Uh, as such, of course, I am uh, very much impressed by your uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, you so much. Some light. Thank you. Uh, now, first, let me come to the first question. That is the difference between the pre-test and the pilot study. I'll, I'll give a very simple example. Now, let's say if you take my questionnaire, I have uh, three or four sections uh, in my questionnaire. So uh, what happened? I'll share my own experience of my PhD. When I started with first, uh, when I started with first section A and section B, I I prepared it. And in that section B, I had uh, some uh, uh, life qualities and other things. And uh, there are some uh, 10 to 15 questions which I have asked it in five point Likert scale. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to do the pre-testing of it. When I did the pre-testing, I I just gave those uh, questions to my own uh, known circle. Uh, you know, uh, few few people uh, correctly they they answered, and few people uh, asked what this word mean. Uh, and a few questions they they told me, see the first question and the ninth question are uh, looking same. So why should we have uh, both the questions again and again? Why should you repeat it again? So that's what we call it as a pretest. And once this pretest is done, now my entire uh, PhD uh, questionnaire is finalized. And then what I did, I again went with some other uh, set of 50 to 100 uh, uh, respondents. I went, I collected the data and then I started testing the reliability, the Cronbach Alpha reliability. And then I also did uh, uh, some uh, normality test to check whether my data is normally uh, distributed or not so that I can apply parametric and non-parametric test. So that after, collect, after finalizing the questionnaire, when I collected the data, that's we call it as a pilot study. There is a small replica. But before uh, that, when I did it only for one section of my questionnaire, that's what we call it as a pretest. Well, number one. Say that when you go for uh, testing a part of the questionnaire, it means uh, pretesting. Pre yes. Uh, when you go for the uh, testing of the entire questionnaire, then it means uh, pilot study. Pilot study. Yes, oh, sir. Okay, number okay, two. Uh, uh, number two. It was more than a question. Dr. Tamil Arasan sir was has actually answered uh, uh, in his question itself. When you know the population size. We can go for random sampling because we can choose whatever the method because we know the population size. But when we do not know the population size, then obviously we should resort it only to the non-random sampling or non-probability sampling okay, okay, because okay. we do not know the population. Okay. Okay. So that's a perfect, uh, in fact, it is actually has answered. So that is second. And uh, regarding the uh, statistical techniques, uh, your objective actually decides what kind of a statistical techniques. I'll tell you a very simple example. Today, most of the young researchers, 
uh, they think statistics is the very difficult part in doing research no not at all i'll tell you what this statistical techniques are actually like a uh, are actually like a vehicle see if i want to if i want to buy a grocery from my nearby shop i can go either by walk or i can go by my cycle but if i want to uh, go to a place where, where it is uh, relatively uh, distance then i can take my uh, two wheeler if it is uh, more uh, if i want to go inter uh, district or interstate then i take my car if i want to go far in i take my uh, uh, flight so these are the different modes of transport which i what actually decides the distance actually matters since because i have a helicopter i cannot take a helicopter and go uh, groceries from the nearby shop okay likewise the statistical te- techniques are plenty of techniques are available today but that is decided based on what your objective is your objective actually decides what kind of a statistical technique to be used whether it has to be uh, if you want to see the associations then you need to go for a correlation provided you have uh, 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 what do i say parametric in nature if your data is non parametric then you can go only for a chi square in order to see the association but if you want to see the differences if your data is parametric then you can go for uh, independent sample uh, which is again if you want to compare two different groups then go for independent sample if you have more than two groups go for f test that is called anova so again everything is decided based on your objective that will actually decide what kind of a statistical technique but in today's world people give more importance only to the statistical technique ignoring what their ob- objective is enga ponundrathu therinjada edhila ponundrathu namu mudivu pannum it's very simple it's as simple as that normally we decide the statistical test based on the scales obviously the scales the objective of the study ah that 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 is there but normally yeah. based on this scales we decide what would be the type of statistical test yes. which we can apply huh? yes yes uh, uh, the young researchers they are not uh, of course so familiar with this uh, scales etc the problem so is sir they are uh, uh, they are not studying research methodology in a strong way in their yeah, mcom yeah. level or in their mphil level sir yeah, yeah. then uh, as you said that uh, most of the uh, resource person they are not giving importance to this validity and reliability concept they yes, are playing sir, yes, a, a crucial role in the context of research whether exactly, it is a sir. questionnaire or a data uh, yes. and of course in almost all the cases and uh, people like you probably you can throw more uh, light on these like aspects on probably the young researchers uh, can be benefited sure sir uh, uh, i need some more uh, time to speak on that content validity yeah, 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 construct yeah, yeah, validity yeah, 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 and all this like in future in future of course sure. you are of course rather attending such uh, and uh, when you are sure. writing as a resource person you can highlight all these uh, uh, factors sure sir sure sir thank sure you, sir. sir thank, thank you, you so thank much you. sir thank a you very so good much, presentation sir. very good presentation thank, thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you thank you it's happy that you all clarified next now it's time to hear the vote of thanks now i am glad to invite mr n elaverson sir assistant professor pg and research department of commerce to deliver vote of thanks sir pesing sir elaverson sir a very good evening all of you i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion let me first of all start by giving glory to the almighty god our swami ji for making today's occasion a resounding success we are grateful to our secretary sir for his word, words of encouragement in completion of this today's webinar in grand success is able guidance us always encouraged as in all the aspect of this online webinar i thank our principal sir for his support vision and commitment towards the webinar from beginning to end first and foremost i thank our special guest dr aj jayanarayan sir who dispute of his busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion i owe special 
gratitude to the participants who have actively participated in today's session and made the event a grand memorable success once again i thank you all for your kind attention thank you sir next kind information to all the participant as i told yesterday today also we send feedback form today session through email and chat box please all of them fill the feedback form for today session thank you all for active participation stay safe and take care thank you all once again thank you jai okay then the session